The PSP, undoubtedly Sony's biggest success in the handheld market between the two that they've made. Seriously, this thing was such an amazing handheld. If you never owned one, you truly missed out. This thing was the home to so many amazing franchises, some of them my absolute favorites. But I'm not here to talk about the PSP itself and its legacy, as there have already been countless of videos on YouTube talking about exactly that. What I want to talk about instead is its racing game library, something that I think has been mostly overlooked. In a previous video, I've already looked at the library of Nintendo DS racing games, which was fairly sparse, but still housed some genuine gems. And now I actually wanted to look at the PSP and its racing game library to see how it stacks up. And so I went out of my way to play 15 racing games on this thing, and I have a lot to say about them. So sit back, relax, and let's take a deep dive into the world of PSP racing game. Let's take a dive into the world of PSP racing. Okay, what the hell? <laughs> Most wanted for the DS? What are you doing in my shower? Everyone hates me after you made that DS video. <laughs> no. I just wanted to be a good DS port, but now everyone <laughs> hates me. <laughs> alright, alright, stop, 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 stop crying. Look, I was just about to talk about some PSP racing games. And who knows, maybe there's gonna be a game in there that's actually gonna be worse than you. And I think once we actually find a game that's worse than you, I'm sure people will stop thinking about you and making fun of you. Uh, really? You think so? Yeah. So what do you say? Care to join me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Alright. So, grab a towel and dry up, please. Alright. So, PSP racing games. Ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Alright. This is the first one I checked out. And what better way to start than with one of the PSP's launch titles. Need for Speed Underground Rivals released a few months after Underground 2 and is supposed to be a new interpretation of the subseries. Take the general gameplay loop of Underground 1 along with its focus on closed tracks and mix it with a bit of flair from Underground 2 such as its soundtrack and atmosphere and you get a pretty decent portable adaptation of Need for Speed Underground. Although I'd say it definitely takes more from Underground 1, some track layouts are even copied outright, and the general handling and physics are definitely very reminiscent of the first Underground. That is, for the better and the worse. The general handling is pretty alright. Cars have a generous amount of grip, but can slip and slide or understeer if handled poorly. This is especially apparent when using some higher powered rear wheel drive cars, or some lower budget front wheel drivers. The handling is certainly controllable enough to navigate through the admittedly very wide tracks and dodge incoming traffic. On the occasion that you do hit traffic though, this is where the physics model rears its ugly head. Some might certainly prefer the way the underground games handled collisions, it was definitely a more realistic approach where head-on collisions with traffic would completely throw your car around with very little ways to control it. While somewhat spectacular, I was never really a fond of these collision physics as they not only break the flow of the game, but also make unavoidable collisions very frustrating. For an arcade racing game, I much prefer the way the sequel Most Wanted handled it, with you just pushing cars out of the way at the cost of some speed. Anagon Rivals unfortunately uses the prior physics model, and with some of the new tracks this issue only gets worse. Thankfully traffic in Anagon Rivals is fairly sparse, so the general racing feels decent with only one complaint. This camera shake is nauseating. I'm not going to deny that playing on a big screen makes this camera shake worse than it may have been on a smaller, original PSP screen, but on some occasions it is genuinely hard to see what's ahead of you because of this violent shaking. This is most obvious in the so-called Nitrous Run events, where you basically get an infinite supply of nitrous as long as you pass through enough gates. While using the nitrous non-stop at very high speeds, it becomes almost impossible to clearly see what's ahead of you. Which brings us to the event types, there are actually quite a few of them. Besides regular circuit racing with variants such as slap knockouts, Street Cross makes a return from Underground 2 as well as a dedicated drift mode, the aforementioned nitrous run and even drag racing. 
Event variety was one of Underground's biggest strengths, so I'm glad this is maintained on the PSP version as well. Drifting in particular works a little differently this time around. You have these zones you need to pass while in a drift and each one gives you a set amount of points. Clear enough of them in succession and you build up a multiplier. Both in handling and execution, these drift events are certainly a lot more simplistic than its counterpart on PC and consoles, but still adds a nice amount of variety into the game. Street Cross is more or less the same as in the other underground games, so is drag racing, but both feature somewhat new tracks to feel a little more distinct. However, there's also one completely new event type that I have not seen in any underground game before, or even in the franchise as a whole. Rally relays are a sort of duel over two laps where you need to switch cars between them. So before you enter an event, you choose which cars you'd like to participate with, which one you want to start with, and which one you'd like to continue with. The race then begins in the first car you chose, and unlike completing a lap like usual, you need to park your car in the parking area, after which you will then gain control of the second car you selected. With this one, you now need to complete a second lap of the track. This is hands down my favorite event type in the entire game, for creative it is, and I wish they would bring it back in future games. So in terms of event variety, Underground Rivals is more than satisfying. However, there lies a problem in how these events are presented. The main progression of the career is divided into quick play battle and circuit races. Each of these have their own completion status and while independent of each other, you still need to participate in both if you want to unlock new cars and upgrades. It's nothing particularly exciting, essentially you are just seeing numbers go up, but it's fine. The main issue lies with each event having achievable medals. Unlike most would probably assume, those are not awarded for your performance, but for how often you have completed each event. First completion gets you bronze, second one silver and the third one a gold trophy. Each medal gives you less money and more driver points, which I have not been able to find any purpose for, but you do reach certain unlocks by completing certain events more than once. Initially I tried ignoring this system as I wasn't really interested in redoing events, especially when some of them are tournaments that take around 15 minutes. But eventually you do get outperformed by opponents in some of the new events, after which you are forced to replay previous events if you want to keep up. This is where I kinda lost interest. This kind of repetition just makes the game artificially longer, which the game can't really afford since the track selection is very small with just 8 unique circuit tracks. The game is essentially demanding you to be completed 3 times over, which just seems unnecessary and grindy for the sake of being grindy. But at the very least, you do get fed rewards and unlocks fairly frequently, most of which being new customization options you can apply to your cars. The customization is pretty decent and about what you would expect for an underground game. Not as deep as Underground 2, but still good enough to make for a fun distraction from the regular racing. An interesting point to highlight is how upgrades and customization relate to the economy of the game. Any visual upgrades are completely free, so you can experiment around with the looks of your car as you please. Therefore, upgrades are more expensive in total, so you will need to buy them one at a time as you can afford them. On the bright side, these upgrades only need to be bought once. So once you buy a new car, the upgrades you have already bought get applied automatically to your new car. Pretty neat. All in all, despite its shortcomings, this is a surprisingly good showing considering it is one of the very first racing games ever developed for the PSP. Although many elements were copied from Underground 1 and 2, it still feels original enough and is definitely worth checking out if you are itching for more nighttime street racing. To bring back the rating system from the Nintendo DS video, I think Need for Speed Rivals sits at a comfortable 7 out of 10. A decent start to this whole list if you ask me. Yeah, what can I say? First one was just a really, really good one. Yeah, you're right. I was hoping it was gonna be kinda bad though. I mean, in all fairness, uh, the underground counterpart on the DS was also pretty decent, so probably pretty unexpected. Yeah, you're right. Let's just check out the next game. I hope you all set it in by now, because we still have a lot of games to go. Number 2 on the list is Street Supremacy, a sort of spin-off title of the Tokyo Extreme Racer series. These games revolve almost entirely around highway racing in various Japanese locales. Street Supremacy is a handheld adaptation of that concept, and as such carries many of the strengths and flaws of the series with it. 
You start the game by picking one of the few starter options available to begin marking your name into becoming a legend on the Wangan. And this is where Street Supremacy shows a very unique element that isn't really present in the other Tokyo Extreme Racer games. In most of them, you would usually simply drop into a pseudo open world in order to find and engage other drivers. Those you would beat one after the other until you would get a surprise challenge from a team leader who you'll have to beat in order to move on to the next territory. It was a very simplistic concept and I was very surprised to see that the PSP adaptation of all things decided to add some much needed depth to the campaign. As such, you will now be asked to join one of three existing teams which each, among many other rival teams, possess one part of the map. After deciding to join one and a short introduction by the team leader, you're being put at the bottom of the team seeing as you are basically running in a stock car with no first-hand experience. It is now your job to climb up the ladder within the team and inevitably challenge the leader to a duel in hopes of taking over the team. You start by challenging drivers of other teams to races to earn some cash, which you can then invest in upgrades into your car. The upgrading and customization system is once again very well done, as is usually the case with these Tokyo Extreme Racer games. I did appreciate the economy not being as bad as in the other games though, I never had to grind out races for hours just to be able to buy a small handful of upgrades. In general, this is easily the least grindy game of the entire series, which might be unfortunate for those who enjoyed the grind, but since these games were always lacking in variety, I very much appreciated it. During the races, you will now also get a feeling for the handling model and physics, which typical for the franchise aren't exactly great. Each car has a very noticeable floatiness to it. It's hard to make precise adjustments and in general the cars never feel as grippy as they should be. Since most of the races don't require you to maneuver around bends and turns however, as well as traffic being very light, it's not as much of an issue as it may sound. What did bug me was the visuals though, mainly how bare bones the environment is. I don't think the game looks particularly bad, but oftentimes there's hardly anything to look at other than the road itself. You may find yourself engulfed in a dark grey void more often than not, that is only occasionally broken up with some simple looking background assets. It's a pretty boring game to look at in all fairness, and the sound isn't doing the game any favors either. While the soundtrack is actually somewhat nice, I don't think I am exaggerating when I say that these are some of the most atrocious car sounds I have ever heard, and are even giving Gran Turismo a run for its money. So while audio visually the game is far from stunning and I am not particularly fond of the handling, how come I still enjoyed the game as much as I did? For that, let's continue along with the story. While climbing up the ladder within this team that I have joined, I eventually made my way to the top and challenged the leader to a race. After being very surprised how pathetically slow he ended up being, he gave me the reins to the team. And this is where the entire game changes fundamentally. Now being the leader, it is up to you to defend your territory, invade other territories, recruit new members and make sure your current members don't leave your team for another one. Think back to the territory system in Need for Speed Carbon, it's somewhat similar but even more thoughtful. Each of the 200 drivers in the game is a distinct character with their own personal car, team association, background info and personality. Along with all of that, each driver has a certain amount of loyalty to their team. This includes members of your team as well and it is up to you to make sure their loyalty is high enough. If they get challenged by other drivers of other teams and lose, they will lose their loyalty to you and eventually leave to join another team. If you lose enough members in a certain district, you may get challenged to a team battle, which if not won, will lose you that territory. If you lose all your territories, your team is forced to disband and it's basically game over. The cool thing? This is exactly what you do to work against the other teams. You invade their territories by challenging their drivers, lower their loyalty to their team so they join yours, until eventually you are able to challenge them to a team battle. In set team battles, you can then choose up to 4 other drivers of your team to participate with you. They will then be pitted against each other one by one. The losers need to go home, while the winners can stay in the team battle for another race. The first team to run out of drivers loses the battle. Win the battle and the district is now yours. This is a really fun system for three reasons. 
Number one, it actually forces you to look into your driver roster to see who the best and fastest drivers are. Number two, since you are progressing one district at a time, you will keep seeing new areas and roads all the time. And number three, it gives you a very nice sense of progression seeing how you were gradually able to conquer all of Tokyo. It gives the entire game a very refreshing layer of depth that, despite the lack of variety, keeps the game fresh throughout its fairly short 5-6 to six hour runtime. Throughout the game you will keep running into all kinds of opponents, some of them being special ones with special cars you wouldn't be able to buy in the dealership. Speaking of which, the car list is disappointingly small even for a game of this caliber, and all of them are Japanese. Sure, for a game like this you would expect mostly Japanese cars, but even the other games in the series had a few European brands to spice things up. But therefore each car really feels like its own entity that you own and have built up yourself, even coming with pretty authentic tire wear and a mileage counter. All in all, I am surprised I enjoyed this game as much as I had considering it's far from eye candy and doesn't particularly have great driving physics. It's definitely a nice addition to any PSP library, if only for the fact that there aren't many racing games like this out there. Street Supremacy managed to blend together a very interesting mix of Japanese car culture and management systems, which makes it possible to overlook its more shallow aspects. And for that, I think another 7 out of 10 is more than fair. Why not continue with another Japanese racing game? Next up in line is Ridge Racer 2 on the PSP, which marks my very first experience with a Ridge Racer game. I have played Unbounded for a total of 82 minutes all the way back in 2014, but I think most would agree that this would hardly count at all. And so with almost no experience or prior knowledge of the franchise as a whole, I jumped right in. The first thing that caught my eye, and ears for that matter, are the amazing visuals and sounds. Every track doesn't just look good, but also oozes with a very distinct atmosphere. Be it a tropical location while the sun is setting, or a neon flooded city in the middle of the night, each track feels unique and distinct. Which is honestly impressive considering there are a total of 24 tracks, that's 3 times as much as Underground Rivals had. But once you actually get put into the car and start pressing down the accelerator, they had no reason to make these sounds as good as they are, so I'm glad they are amazing anyways. And all this gets presented with a great soundtrack to boot. There really isn't much to complain about from a purely audiovisual standpoint, other than maybe the car models themselves being a bit poor with a noticeably low polygon count and livery resolution. But that's all in regards to graphics and sound, but what do you actually do in Ridge Racer 2? The main campaign puts you into a total of 4 tours, which are essentially a set of championships for you to beat. These get increasingly difficult over time and introduce faster and faster car classes into the mix, as well as more complex tracks. Beating a championship nets you a new car as a reward, although I would only use the word new in quotation marks as these reward cars are really just slightly altered versions of cars you already own. And that's kinda all you do in the game. You don't really have any say as to which championships to complete next as they unlock in a linear fashion. The championships themselves always feature the same type of event, that being a 3 lap circuit event. And yes, it is always 3 laps. You are always starting last and you will always need to catch up to the leader. There really isn't anything to shake things up, which is strange as the game does have different game modes such as time trials, survival or duels. Even though these aren't too different from the regular circuit races, it still would have been nice to see these integrated into the tours to add some variety. The actual variety here comes from the tracks themselves, as well as the different handling types that each car possesses. As said before, each track feels distinct, and this applies to the actual track design as well. Some of my favorite courses have huge jumps, downhill sections, coastlines, and much more. It's rare to see the same track twice in quick succession, and even then it is usually in reverse at the very least. This also applies to the cars themselves with their handling types. Basically, every car has one of three handling characteristics. There are cars that are easy to control, but therefore are harder to do long drifts with due to the added grip, cars that are harder to control but offer the opportunity to extend drifts a lot more, and some that try to find a middle ground between the two. I usually like to settle for the all-rounder cars, as they perform well on both the technical and high-speed tracks. 
It's hard for me to say which of these is definitively the fastest. But since drifting charges up your boost bar, it's plausible that the driftier but harder to control cars have the most potential. Which finally brings me to the handling itself. Which I'm sure must look very strange for those of you who have never played or seen a Ridge Racer game before. Although it might look very random, the best I can explain it is that each car is sort of following the road automatically, kind of like they are on rails. It is up to you to drift through the corners by either tapping the brake or the gas without losing too much speed or losing control. Do long but quick drifts and you will fill up your nitrous bar, which you can use on straights for some extra speed. It took me some time to get used to, mainly because it's unlike anything I have ever played, but after a few laps I had figured out how to get around the track on one piece. The key was to simply trust the game guiding my car along the track and simply make adjustments to it. Once you've figured it out, you can actually make some very smooth maneuvers around these tracks and it feels incredibly satisfying, especially on higher speeds. Simply for the fact that it's unlike anything else out there, I'd recommend anyone interested to try out a Ridge Racer game themselves. Ridge Racer 2, despite its disappointing lack of variety, managed to win me over to the franchise and I'd love to check out more games of the franchise in the future. This game in particular was designed as a sort of best of album of the games that came before it, featuring many fan favorite tracks and songs of previous games. So in my eyes, this is a great starting point for anyone who wants to try out the Ridge Racer series, and a pretty easy 8 out of 10 for me. I gotta say, this was my first Ridge Racer game and I liked it a lot. I know it's pretty good, but I was hoping we could find some bad racing games to restore my reputation. Alright, alright, alright. So, let's just check out your own counterpart on the PSP, shall we? With now three good games under the belt, color me genuinely excited for what's to come. And there goes my excitement. If you have watched the prequel to this video, the bizarre world of Nintendo DS racing games, you might remember the DS version of Need for Speed Most Wanted. Not only did I crown that port as the worst racing game on the Nintendo DS, but also as one of the worst racing games I have ever played. Almost nothing in that game was even remotely enjoyable. It was a complete disaster and something which might go down in history as the worst Need for Speed game ever made across every system. So imagine my extreme caution when I loaded up the PSP version, now with the subtitle 510 for the first time. For all I knew, it could be just as bad as the DS version. But is it really? Well, in some regards yes, but in most thankfully not. I would describe Most Wanted 510 as painfully average. Pretty much nothing about this port of Most Wanted stands out as compelling or exciting. The subtitle 510 may give off the impression that this is a different take on Most Wanted, kind of like Carbon on the City. Different story, different characters, but it really doesn't stray much further from the source material other than changes made because of hardware limitations. As such, the open world of Rockport has been condensed into a few closed tracks whose layouts have actually been copied from certain sections of Underground 2's map. The car list is noticeably smaller, with less customization options available. All these things are fine considering this is running on a PSP, a handheld which opted in for these tiny UMDs which barely hold enough space to save an image of a cat. While these are obvious and honestly forgivable downgrades, there are also others which are less forgivable. Let's start with the story, or lack thereof. While Most Wanted's story isn't exactly a narrative masterpiece, and never was intended to be, it's something many fans remember fondly. Razor was a dick and he wanted to drive him into the ground. It was a simple and effective way to motivate the player to finish the game. And while I would understand that compressing all the cutscenes, even if there aren't all that many, would be too challenging considering the limited amount of disk space, not even having a few still images with text explaining what's going on just feels incredibly strange. Hey, here's this random list of races we need you to beat for no other reason other than for the sake of it. Fair enough. I don't expect a narrative in a PSP game, but it does take one of Most Wanted's most compelling elements away. Next on the list of compelling elements that have been butchered are the cops. As expected, they behave a bit more like the cops in Hot Pursuit 2, since that game also took place on closed tracks. Yet in Most Wanted 510, they are completely brain dead and have an absurd amount of rubber band. If you have a cop on your tail, 
there's absolutely nothing you can do to shake him off unless he gets himself stuck somewhere. To put it simply, in the original Most Wanted the cops were a fun challenge and here they are a nuisance. This is in large part due to the game giving you no incentive to actually engage the cops and no control over when to do so. They just spawn randomly in a race and you have to deal with them somehow until you cross the finish line. After the race you get the option of continuing if you have a cop on you. The game calls this doubling down. If you manage to escape the cops in the given time frame, you earn twice the money and an insultingly low amount of respect, which is required to progress in the game. Doubling down is almost never worth it, as it is entirely based on luck whether you escape or not. You have pretty much no tools at your disposal to defend yourself. Not even something like a pit maneuver is doable since the cops are much heavier than you. These bonus events don't even properly work in a way that makes sense, as these are essentially outrun races. As such, the cops won't actually try to slow down your car to bust you, but will instead try to drive far enough ahead of you. And if the cop loses you, you somehow lose. What? And when you lose these, you also lose all the progress from the event itself and have to do it all over again. Which is hardly ever fun considering there is hardly any variety in game modes, each race tends to be much longer as it should, you unlock new cars and upgrades painfully slowly, and the driving itself is hardly anything to write home about. Something about the tracks and the overall game speed is just incredibly lame. I almost never have to take any sharp turns and in return almost never have to actually brake and properly approach a corner. It's mostly full speed ahead with hardly any traffic or road hazards. The racing aspect of 510 is utterly mind numbing and probably the reason why I dropped the game after only a couple of hours. The only solace for Most Wanted 510 is a bonus mode where you play as a cop and need to arrest other racers by ramming them. This mode was actually a refreshing break from the monotony of the career, even if not inherently challenging. And honestly, that's all there is to say about Most Wanted 510. It really is painfully average as mentioned in the beginning, in some aspects even under delivering such as with the cops. And in some weird way, that might even be worse than a game that's laughably terrible. Because that one can at least be enjoyed ironically. Most Wanted 510 can't be enjoyed at all, no matter how you approach it. However, since there isn't much inherently broken with the game and might be enjoyable for the first hour or so, I'll still give this game a 3 out of 10. Certainly heaps better than the DS version, but still never something I would recommend, even to diehard fans of the original. If you want to play Most Wanted on the go, you are probably much better off emulating the GameCube version on your phone. What a shame. See? See? The PSP version is bad. It, it must be worse than me, right? Like it was just... lame. No? It wasn't... it wasn't... terrible, it was just... Not good. Ah, uh, yeah, I guess you're right. I guess the PSP version is better than I am. What else we got? There's still plenty more games to go. I'm sure we'll find something. All right, there goes the first subpar game of the video. It had to happen at some point, but maybe the follow-up game can prove to be an improvement. It's LA Rush. Okay. Released in the same year as Most Wanted, LA Rush was Midway's attempt at capitalizing on the street racing hype. With features from West Coast Customs, a story, an admittedly very interesting car list, and a pretty accurate depiction of LA, everything was looking good for LA Rush to be a smash hit. Unfortunately, that's not how things turned out. LA Rush would be the final nail in the coffin for the Rush franchise and Midway as a whole. But who knows? Maybe LA Rush could turn out to be a hidden gem, in particular with the PSP version. And to my initial surprise, LA Rush on the PSP is actually an almost beat for beat port of the original game on PC and home consoles. The map, the cars, the handling, even the shockingly good damage model and physics made its way onto the PSP somehow. The most major difference lies in how the map is now divided into their own areas you need to fast travel to. But the areas themselves are almost identical to the main version. LA Rush even features a surprisingly high amount of traffic, probably the highest traffic density we will ever see in a PSP racing game. So what's not to like about this game, which seems to be a technical marvel considering the hardware and space it is running on? Well, 
quite a few things. Most of these boil down to the general issues with the game that are also present in the PSP version. The handling is strange, to say the least. Controlling the cars is often more challenging than it needs to be for a game of this caliber. Especially strange is the car's behavior when lifting off the gas, which I would do occasionally to dodge traffic or keep control of the car. When lifting off the gas, the cars gain an absurd amount of grip which can be hard to snap out of. As such, I will often hit things unintentionally because I didn't expect the car to behave in such a way. As praiseworthy as the map and its implementation onto the PSP is, I also can't say I'm a huge fan of it layout-wise. There are countless objects sticking out everywhere, and driving off the road usually results in you hitting something and getting stuck. Some areas are very confusing to navigate, especially the fourth part of the game is an absolute nightmare. And finally, this is probably the most obvious thing, the game really does not look good. Even if I were to play the game on an original PSP, I cannot imagine the lighting and shading looking pleasant at all, and it took some getting used to the quite frankly horrid look of the game. I also wasn't a fan of LA Rush's progression. While the story is incredibly cheesy, cringeworthy even, it sets up a pretty decent narrative with the main goal being retrieving all the cars that have been stolen from you. While novel, it makes obtaining cars feel like a chore rather than something exciting. You know, maybe I don't care about this Dodge Ram, maybe I want to stick to something sporty, but since I have no say in the matter, I need to retrieve every car in the exact order the game intended. It's incredibly lame and the collecting aspect of filling up your garage didn't appeal to me very much. At least the events themselves are pretty fun when you need to retrieve a car, but this is mostly because of the absurdly ruthless AI and amount of pursuers after you. It was quite amusing to see all these cars crashing into everything and flying all over the place all in a desperate attempt to stop me. But all that unfortunately can't mask how flat the game falls in general. The aforementioned feature with West Coast Customs is a good example. It was an obvious way to advertise the game, but the unfortunate downside is that customization is pretty much non-existent. You can drive one of your cars into a tuning shop and you will get a pre-built car handed back to you. You have no say in which parts should be applied or even which color the car should have. It's incredibly lame, especially when oftentimes the pre-built just gets a different set of rims, exhaust and color applied. I think a good way to explain LA Rush would be wide as the ocean, deep as a puddle. Although at first it may seem like a technical marvel with its very intricate map, car list and insane damage model. Seriously, this damage system is so much better than it has any right to be. It can't mask how shallow the rest of the game feels. Although you earn currency, it's basically useless. There isn't a whole lot of event variety, no customization, not even performance upgrades. It's an incredibly flat experience that really doesn't offer much you can't get in other, much superior racing games. In the end, I think LA Rush is worth checking out for those who are curious, and can certainly provide some enjoyment even if unintentional, which is definitely more than I can say about most wanted 510. As such, I will give LA Rush a perfectly average score of 5 out of 10. Alright, so I suppose that wraps up the first 5 games. I don't know, Dustin. So far, these games all seem pretty decent. Yeah, I know, but you gotta remember, like, most of these PSP games probably had a little bit more budget to them. You're not really giving me a lot of hope here. I was hoping for some worse games. That's what you promised. Alright, 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 alright. Man, let's just check out the next five games. And so we continue with the sixth game of the video, that being Asphalt Urban GT2. For brevity's sake, I will continue to simply call the game Asphalt 2 from here on out. Asphalt 2 marks the first game which renders in direct parallel to its counterpart for the Nintendo DS, which I have reviewed in my previous video. If you don't remember, Asphalt 2 on the DS was a great feat for its system, featuring decent looking graphics, fun gameplay and a variety of unique customization options. Now going into the PSP version, which interestingly enough actually released around half a year after the DS version, I somewhat expected a straightforward upgrade in every aspect, and that's also what I got. For the most part. Let's start with the things which stayed the same. From my point of view, the content in both of these versions is practically identical. That means there aren't any extra cars or tracks in this PSP version, which is quite a shame considering there were several months and lots of extra disk space to work with. 
In general, Asphalt 2 on PSP maintains mostly faithful to its original version on the DS. However, that changes drastically when we take a look at the actual gameplay. The vehicle handling model has been completely overhauled and is barely comparable to the DS version anymore. The DS version went for a fairly loose brake to drift handling model a la Burnout. While it certainly had its imperfections, it was controllable enough to warrant a thrilling, albeit a little generic and repetitive experience as most cars handled pretty much the same. This concept gets flipped on its head over on the PSP. As for 2 on the PSP, actually goes for a more believable, dare I say, simcade approach. There are now distinct differences in drivetrain types. Primary drivers will understeer, while a lack of throttle control and counter steering will spin you out in a rear wheel drive car. The simplistic brake to drift handling has been swapped out for a much more intricate grip handling model akin to black boxes need for speed games like Underground 2 or Carbon. Such a drastic change in handling comes with a fundamentally different way the game is being played. Now I had to approach corners at an appropriate speed, brake and slow down accordingly, hit apexes and take proper racing lines. It gives the entire game a very refreshing layer of complexity that, to this day, is still unrivaled in the entire Asphalt franchise, which is most commonly known for its over-the-top arcade gameplay nowadays. However, I can't pretend that something didn't get lost along the way with this change. First and foremost, the general game speed is a lot slower, and the sense of speed from the DS version isn't really present anymore. And with that you lose a bit of that chaoticness which made the DS version such a thrill. This PSP version, despite its extra layer of complexity and added variety in car behavior, has become sanitized. It's difficult for me to say which approach is the better one as I still enjoy driving in both games. It ultimately boils down to what you are looking for in a racing game. Ultimately I think both versions are enjoyable to play and manage to accomplish what they set out to do. Another major difference between the two versions is the pacing of the main campaign. Just like on the DS version you pick your starter car after completing an introductory race, or two in the PSP version, and then begin to slowly build up your garage as you progress in the game. It's still really fun progressing through the different championships, requiring you to try out all kinds of cars and getting faster over time. The main difference here is how quickly, or slowly rather, you progress this time around. While on the DS version you were completing championships and races fairly quickly and unlocking new content in a much quicker fashion, the PSP version takes a lot more time to complete. The championships tend to be a tad longer and along with the new handling model resulting in longer races, progressing in the game just took a tad bit too long for a handheld game in my opinion. It would have been fine if the decrease in pacing would have been accommodated with new content, but as mentioned earlier there aren't any new additions, so you are essentially just spending more time than necessary with the same old tracks and cars. But that's about all there is to say in regards to the gameplay, which despite my critique I still enjoyed a fair amount. Visually speaking I expected more of an upgrade however. While I still enjoy the track variety and their unique look, something about it just looks awfully flat. The same goes for the sounds, which are inexcusably bad and roughly on the same level as Street Supremacy. Considering the much more powerful hardware and great examples we have already seen, I expected much more of an upgrade here, especially considering the lack of additional content. To round things off, there were a few minor things which bugged me. One of the DS version's coolest features was a first person view when using bikes. This didn't make it into the PSP version for what I can only consider a lack of care or time. The music also features a few different tracks. The iconic song Lift Me Up by Moby has been replaced with a rock song that gets annoying fairly quickly. And lastly, this might actually be too significant to be considered minor, but the car models look quite awful. The proportions are not just a little bit off, but way off on some cars like the Subaru Impreza. And besides the obvious upgrade and texture quality, they actually managed to look worse than the models on the DS version. So all in all, while still being a slightly above average racing game thanks to its great handling, customization and tracks, Asphalt 2 on the PSP unfortunately turned out to be a bit of a disappointment. No new content being added as well as an unsatisfying visual upgrade might not make the PSP version the worst way to play the game, but certainly the most underwhelming way. The DS version was a very pleasant surprise for a DS racing game, whereas the PSP version somewhat underdelivered considering the hardware is running on. 
In my previous video I gave Asphalt 2 on the DS a 7 out of 10 and despite me considering the PSP version as superior overall, I will still give this one a 6 out of 10. That's because the bar for PSP games is much higher than the one for DS racing games. As well as the aspect of disappointment considering this version had several extra years in the oven. Quite a shame, but still a game worth playing regardless of the platform you choose. I'd honestly suggest trying out both versions and sticking with the one you click with the most. Alright, there. Asphalt 2. Actually worse than the DS game. Surely that means it's also worse than I am, right? Yeah, it was a bit of a disappointment for sure, but I can't say it was particularly terrible. I mean, the handling was actually somewhat alright. Ah, uh, fine. So show me the next game. Next in line is a game I never expected to have received a PSP port. Test Drive Unlimited released in 2006 and was an absolute marvel for its time. The size and drivable terrain of the map was simply unprecedented for its time, and all of it was connected without any loading screens. The same goes for the game's extensive car roster and character customization aspects. By far and wide, the first Test Drive Unlimited, or TDU for short, was clearly ahead of its time and a technical showcase of what racing games could be capable of in the not so distant future. Now, how can one condense such a vast experience onto a handheld? My initial expectation was that the map would be heavily altered in a similar way we saw in LA Rush. Much simplified and divided into smaller areas with loading screens separating them. But that's not how it turned out to be. The map in its entirety featuring all the areas, shops and drivable terrain has been implemented at a scale of 1 to 1 onto the PSP version. This alone has to make TDU the most technically impressive game on the system. Being able to drive on a map this huge with little to no barrier stopping you from exploring or any loading screens interrupting the experience is simply unbelievable. In general, the most impressive aspect of the PSP port is how incredibly faithful it is to its main counterpart on PS2 and PC. Just like on those systems, you can find and enter any kind of car dealers and look at the cars on offer here. You can buy a variety of houses which all have unique interiors, as well as a fully modeled garage where you can store your cars. The car models themselves, while obviously lacking a little fidelity, still look accurate. And arguably, but most importantly, the free progression system has been maintained as well. You can pick and choose from a number of races to participate in and buy whichever cars you desire to progress in the game. Or you can decide to skip doing races altogether and drive around the map on your own volition, as new events are unlocked via master points, which are similar to kudos or skill points from other racing games and get awarded through skillful driving. Drive fast, do jumps and drift around and eventually you will hit the next point threshold, which will open up new events for you. Alternatively, you can enter clubs, which typically demand a certain kind of vehicle specification from you. Clubs in essence are a sort of mini blacklist, with having to beat a handful of races in duels until you climb to the top of the leaderboard. Becoming president of a club will net you sweet rewards such as free upgrades or even a new car. Occasionally, certain races will require certain specifications from you as well, so buying new cars is something you'll be doing fairly frequently. There's great incentive to try out all kinds of cars, especially since upon buying one you unlock new events as well. Before entering a race, you are able to visit tuning shops where you can upgrade your car and occasionally it changes the visuals as well, like in my case where my 350Z got the Nismo body kit. In general, the PSP port of TDU is absurdly faithful to its PC and home console counterpart and for that alone deserves a lot of praise. However, this amount of faithfulness comes at a price. For one, the game looks pretty flat. It's certainly not the worst looking game I've seen yet, mainly due to a decent color palette and good car models, but the graphical fidelity has taken a massive hit. The lighting is very simplistic, there are pretty much no visible shadows and all kinds of reflections are also absent. Visually it reminds me somewhat of a Dreamcast game and the PSP can certainly do better than that. However, the hit in graphical fidelity can be excused thanks to the sheer volume and content. Speaking of content, however, the PSP version had to make a few cuts in that department as well. Namely, a few cars which are missing, as well as the entire character customization being absent. This also comes with a lack of cockpit view. However, given the hardware specs, it's more than understandable. 
Most detrimentally though, and this is what essentially renders the game borderline unplayable for a racing game, the frame rate is kept to 19 frames per second. That's right, 19. Now if you're just cruising around in the open world, it might not be such a big deal and something you can get used to. But once you get your hands on faster cars and need to make fine adjustments to dodge traffic, it becomes a massive issue. A natural side effect of low frame rates is an increase in input delay, and this is what made racing in TDU pretty unpleasant. So unpleasant in fact that I went out of my way to install a 60fps patch, as I genuinely could not see myself playing a racing game for that long on such a low frame rate. Once I installed the patch and got rid of the resulting input delay, I finally realized how good the handling model can be. Cars handle very smoothly and have generous amounts of grip, but can still slip and slide under extreme conditions. Pair this with great road layouts and seemingly endless amount of races, and you actually got yourself a decent racing experience under the hood. One aspect I found myself a bit disappointed by is how the map is implemented into the game. Despite its impressive inclusion, I can't help but think that it doesn't really serve a point in this particular iteration of the game. The enjoyment from having such a huge map isn't just its amount of roads, but the fact that it's littered with all kinds of shops, car dealers and other things to explore. This entire exploration aspect has been completely removed on the PSP version. For some strange reason, every dealership, tuning shop and even buyable house is already marked on the map before you have even discovered it. You simply have to drive to them in order to enter. In my opinion this really kills all enjoyment to drive around the map. It was exhilarating to explore all kinds of areas and discover a new car dealer with never before seen cars in its inventory on the original version. When creating a map this huge, it's important to give players reasons to interact with it in a meaningful way, and unfortunately on the PSP version the map itself feels more like padding since you are basically just driving from A to B to C with nothing exciting or surprising to discover. One more critique point I have to leave as a footnote here are the cops. Yes, there are police in the game and if they see you violate traffic laws or ram other vehicles, they will begin to chase after you. Simply put, the cops in this game are a joke as they are actually unable to follow you off the road and are incredibly passive even on the highest heat level. They don't try to ram you off the road, they don't go for pit maneuvers, really don't try any attempts to slow you down. The cops in TDU are such a non-factor, it makes me think if the resources and time spent on them wouldn't have been better spent elsewhere. All in all, however, the PSP port of TDU is probably the most technically impressive game we will see throughout this entire video. Never ever did I expect such a faithful port of the original with its plethora of content and attention to detail, despite the few things that have been cut. It's just such a bummer the framerate is so abysmal, as it really hindered me from enjoying the game long term. This puts me in an awkward spot as my rating for this game would depend a lot on whether I include the 60fps patch into my rating. I think at its original frame rate, the game would only sit at a 7 out of 10. While faithful, the game unfortunately falls a bit flat as a racing game and is more of an experience rather than anything else. With the patch however, the game is easily upgraded to a 9 out of 10 as then the actual racing aspect of the game begins to be fun as well. I think everyone here would have their own opinion on what I should base my rating off of. So in order to piss off both crowds, I will simply side with neither side of the argument and settle for an 8 out of 10. Man, TDU was just really impressive. It's a bit unfortunate with the frame rate, but um, they're a really, really impressive game. What do you think? Well, I think the game is pretty much unplayable. I mean, you said it yourself, 19 FPS? I mean, that's just terrible. I mean, the frame rate didn't really ruin the game. As I said, it just kind of made the racing not as good, but as an experience, it was still really nice. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fine, you're right. What's the next game? Many developers in the late 2000s tried their luck at translating some of their franchises onto the PSP, and arguably one of the biggest success stories had to be Rockstar Games. Having previously managed to develop fully fleshed out Grand Theft Auto experiences for Sony's handheld, Jesus, Tony, you drive like a bitch. Rockstar wanted to take a shot at porting their most recent Midnight Club game as well. And so Midnight Club Los Angeles, now with the subtitle Remix, hit the handheld in 2008. This is actually the only racing game I played during my short period where I did own a PSP myself as a kid, and I certainly remember having an amazing time with it. But will that still be the case after all those years? 
Well, I must ruin the surprise a little bit, as I have already revisited the game roughly three years ago. The short and simple answer is yes, I very much still enjoy it, even nowadays. But let us have a more critical look at Rockstar's portable racing game. As previously mentioned, this port wears the subtitle Remix. And this isn't just for show. In essence, Midnight Club LA on the PSP incorporates many elements and content from various different entries of the series and merges them into one. And so we have two maps from Midnight Club 2, those being Los Angeles and Tokyo, along with Midnight Club 3's general handling and physics model, with the story, music, cars and customization from Los Angeles serving as the backdrop. In my opinion, this was an absolutely genius idea, as it not only creates something entirely unique, but the elements which have been taken from each game are actually the best ones in their respective games. Midnight Club 2 has the most interesting maps, Midnight Club 3 the best handling model, and Midnight Club Los Angeles the most fun characters. Your girlfriend found me funny. She did. Ooh. She was confused, wondering why you dressed like you're playing golf. Cool! <laughs> Shut up, y'all! At least that's all in my opinion. The maps themselves are actually separated into different career modes. Initially, you are only able to start the Los Angeles career, which puts you right in to select a starter car and make a name for yourself in Los Angeles. And this is where we can immediately notice an incredibly high level of graphical fidelity. The car models have to be the most detailed and accurate ones we have seen thus far. The lighting of the game still looks great, and the reflections on the car almost seem a little too detailed considering the low resolution the game would usually be displayed at on original hardware. And if that wasn't enough, there are also several distinct time of day settings, letting us see Los Angeles and Tokyo during the daylight for the first time. The sunsets in particular look absolutely stunning with the light and colors bursting through the city's skyline. Without a doubt, this game is easily the best looking one we have seen so far, and on top of that runs reasonably well too. Upon competing in the first few races, we can immediately notice the similarities in vehicle handling to Midnight Club 3. Although I'd say it feels a little more polished, with cars feeling ever so slightly snappier and providing more grip through corners. The special abilities return as well upon unlocking them in the career, with zone letting you slow down time and multiplying the grip on your car, easily the most useful one in my opinion, roar shoving all cars in your vicinity out of the way, and aggro turning your car into an unstoppable bulldozer. It is now your job to earn more money and respect while completing a variety of missions to progress through the game. Along the way you can complete optional missions, such as time trials or payback missions, where you need to destroy someone else's car by damaging them. These aren't super exciting, but serve as a decent diversion from all the racing you'll be doing. And since there aren't that many, I enjoyed completing them regardless. And if you still need a break from all the racing, you can find collectibles on the map which will give you various unique vinyls when collecting all of them. In between races, you will be upgrading and customizing your car, with most parts being taken straight from the console versions. A few cuts were made here and there, such as the interior customization as the PSP port sadly, but understandably does not have a cockpit view. But even despite that, the customization here is still nothing short of impeccable, even letting you change the size, width and profile of the tires, as well as quite literally over a hundred different vinyl designs. And that's not to mention all the small details like being able to change the license plate or selecting a different racing suit when on a bike. The customization here is simply on another level and puts every Need for Speed game on the PSP to shame. Speaking about bikes, they also make an appearance here and have to be the most enjoyable bikes out of the entire series. Although the selection is fairly small with only sports bikes, they handle pretty much like a tuna car on crack with absurd amounts of grip. I wasn't really a fan of the bikes in Midnight Club 3, but the tweaks made to them here paid off tenfold, with them actually being my favorite vehicle class in the entire game. They provide a perfect balance of risk versus reward and can be absurdly quick if you manage to stay on them. Talking about vehicle classes, most of the ones from Midnight Club 3 are represented here along with their unique characteristics and special abilities. For example, muscle cars are very drifty but quick in a straight line, whereas luxury sedans are very heavy but therefore unstoppable against traffic. During the game you'll be required to try them all out at least once and I enjoyed the variety these classes provided. And so you start to slowly but surely grow a garage full of personalized vehicles. The progression in this game was very satisfying and at no point felt grindy or boring to me. 
you were always working towards something, saving up for the next car or challenging new drivers. It's also worth mentioning that LA Remix is probably the easiest game out of the entire franchise. I assume this was a deliberate choice, as the average PlayStation with a handheld is usually pretty short, and Rockstar likely wanted to avoid players being stuck at a single race for the entire duration. Some may not like this, as the difficulty was certainly a trademark for the series, but personally, I didn't mind it that much. After roughly 7 hours, you'll be reaching the conclusion to the LA career. I didn't go too much into detail in regards to the story, mainly because there isn't really much of a plot. Most characters you meet are mostly just there to provide a backdrop to the events you'll be participating in. It's more flavor text than anything really, especially because the back and forth banter is actually oddly entertaining to listen to. Yeah, I was pro-life until I met you. <laughs> the only notable thing that's happened in the career, which by the way is solely told through voice lines instead of cutscenes, is when you participate in a team race with Book, who introduced you to the street racing scene in the beginning of the game. After the race you'll both be pursued by cops, to which your main character actually ditches Book to fend off for himself, which causes some friction between the two. This culminates in a final race for the Street King title, which you'll happily take off Book in the end. It's nothing super exciting, but as said before, ties together the events and tournaments you'll be participating in quite nicely. And if you think you're done after all that, you still have the entire Tokyo career waiting for you. Another 5 hour long adventure where you start fresh with an empty garage and a name to make for yourself. I actually really enjoyed this soft reset on the career. Your progress in LA is still saved in case you want to return of course. The Tokyo career, besides the vastly different map, provides some handful of unique cars you couldn't obtain in LA, as well as a completely new set of characters and dialogue which are entirely unique to LA Remix. Your main goal in Tokyo is to get picked up by the Notorious Midnight Club, a street organization that actually existed back then in Japan and become their new leader. It's nothing game changing as you'll be going through the same form of progression as in the LA career, but the new map and cars definitely made it worth playing regardless. And that wraps up about everything there is to cover about Midnight Club LA Remix. Needless to say this game absolutely blew me away, even though this is my third playthrough of the game. As mentioned in the beginning of this segment, Rockstar has already proven they were able to fully translate the GTA series to the PSP and they have done it masterfully with the Midnight Club series. There is absolutely nothing in this game that feels half-assed. Everything here feels fleshed out and true to the series and at no point did I get the impression that I was playing a lesser version of a series I'm all too familiar with. The idea to mix together a bunch of assets and content from previous games in the series to create a fresh, unique and enjoyable package was nothing short of a stroke of genius. It makes me wonder why they didn't give this game the same treatment as the GTA Stories games, which ended up getting a port to the PlayStation 2 due to their high level of quality and success. Midnight Club Los Angeles could have easily had a cross-generation release with the PlayStation 2 in the same way, with LA Remix serving as the base. I'm sure many people would have loved that, and some might have even preferred this last gen version due to its roots in all the entries of the series. But to wrap this up, the absolute highest praise I can give to a PlayStation Portable game is that it feels like a PlayStation 2 game. Midnight Club LA Remix doesn't just feel exactly like that, but feels like it could have been one of the most beloved racing games on the entire system. No other rating than a straight up 10 out of 10 would feel fair to me. And me fully completing both careers to 100% for the third time now is the best testament to that. Man, Man Club LA Remix really must be my favorite. I mean, this had a little bit of everything to offer, you know, it had good graphics, good physics, fun gameplay, it just had a little bit of everything. I'm losing my patience, Dustin. I was promised some bad games, not masterpieces. Alright, fine, fine. This is now the Need for Speed game. With a game such as Midnight Club LA Remix, it will be tough for any game to follow up. Nonetheless, I decided to turn my attention towards Need for Speed Carbon, Own the City. Once more, this is a title we have previously checked out in my video on DS Racing Games. And it actually became one of the best ones on Nintendo's handheld. With that in mind, the cards for Carbon on the City on the PSP are looking pretty good. So how does it compare to its disappointing predecessor? To reiterate, Carbon on the City tells a unique story involving your main character and his brother having a fatal accident during a race. After waking up from a coma with severe memory loss, you find out your brother has passed away in the accident and it is now up to you to find out who took out your brother and reclaim the streets. 
In comparison to the DS version, the cutscenes here are actually fully voiced this time around, which is much appreciated. Despite a handful of very strange moments, I like the story overall. It certainly goes for a much darker tone and doesn't overstay its welcome. The main issue with the story is rather how it is presented. The ending is the perfect example of that, so skip forward a few seconds if you don't want the story spoiled for you. At the end of the game you find out that the person who ordered a hit on your brother was actually yourself. Apparently he treated his girlfriend like trash and was overall impossible to tolerate, so your main character decided to end it all. I must admit that I can appreciate a twist like that, but the way all of this is staged is just utterly ridiculous. Why are we hugging to Victoria's music playing as the sun is going up? I am literally a murderer and I should be ashamed of myself. The severe ramifications from the ending twist are completely ignored and ruin what could otherwise be a very dark and memorable ending. But anyways, let's talk about the actual gameplay itself. In general, this is Need for Speed Carbon as you know it. You take over territories by completing events in them and beating their respective leader, all while further upgrading your own cars and expanding your crew. An interesting point of note here is that the PSP version actually seems to take this entire concept to a much higher level than the PC and console versions. Not only do you have more rival crews with more territories to take over, but you also recruit a lot more crewmates, which are all still fully voiced. They even have brief character bios which... Well, yeah, don't really say much. But still, it seems like a lot more ideas went into this system on the PSP version. One major difference in regards to your crew, your wingman in particular, is the absence of the previous scouter class, who would mark shortcuts on your map. Since the tracks on the PSP version are a lot more simplistic with less shortcuts and alleyways, the scouter class has been swapped out for the assassin class. Assassins will try to drop spike strips in front of your opponents when prompted, but be careful as those spike strips can affect you too. In general the wingmen here don't work quite as well. For one, the brawler class is completely pointless as they accomplish the same task the assassins can do, but less reliably. Drafters have a weird magnetic pull to them which can occasionally completely throw you offline. On the upside however you can bring two wingmen into a race instead of just one. Besides their overall class, your wingmen can occasionally have special perks, such as fixers increasing the payout you get from events. These special perks unfortunately render almost all of the other crewmates useless though, as there is pretty much no point in using a wingman without a perk. During races your wingmen will also earn skill points, which don't do anything you'd expect, and just exist to increase your crew's overall skill level that is needed to recruit certain new crewmates. So overall, while there is certainly more depth in the crew and territory mechanics than in the PC and console versions, it still feels a bit shallow overall. But what about the actual racing portion of the game? In case you haven't noticed yet, Cabin on the City recycles two districts from Most Wanted's map, Rosewood and Rockport. Something I'm actually perfectly fine with, as the overall environmental design has been drastically changed and doesn't resemble Most Wanted in the slightest anymore. The map, although its general layout has been copied, still feels distinct. I suppose it is also worth noting that this map is actually freely explorable. Unlike Underground Rivals and Most Wanted 5.0, you aren't restricted to closed tracks anymore but can drive around the map freely. Although it is mostly optional, you can start a pursuit to earn some cash or find some hidden crates to unlock concept art. It's neat for those who want it, but the game doesn't really integrate its open world into the rest of the game in a meaningful way. At most you have some event types which require you to pick up a package before your opponents do or escape pursuers to an escape point, but the massive green arrow at the top of the screen takes away any sort of navigation you need to do yourself. These open world events really just feel like sprint races without barriers. I'm also fairly mixed on how I should feel about the handling in this game. While at high speeds driving can be quite exhilarating, with cars having absurd amounts of grip, there really is little to no depth in it all. Everything feels extremely stiff and there's hardly any consequences for bad driving. I think Underground Rivals definitely had superior handling. Nonetheless, there is certainly fun to be had in its simplicity. A similar amount of simplicity can be found in the customization. In general, it's sadly a step back once again from Underground Rivals, with only a handful of options being available for each car. 
The best example for this are your hood options, which literally boil down to painted or carbonized. To come back to handling and physics, this is where I need to be a bit more harsh. Quite honestly, the physics in carbon on the city feel completely broken. This gets especially obvious when using your drafters, or when landing a jump on your front tires. For some reason, the car will keep its rear wheels elevated after landing, as if it's doing a nose manual. Not only is this incredibly annoying, but can also lose you a race occasionally. The AI in this game is on a similar broken level. Not only will they present an insulting amount of rubber band on occasion, but are also extremely stupid as they have no spatial awareness whatsoever. They will even hit pillars that are right in front of them and could have been easily avoided. All in all, I can't help but get this cheap feeling from the game. It's obvious that the game was scrambled together in mere months on a tight budget. But with that being said, Carbon on the City is still a mostly enjoyable experience, largely thanks to its tight progression and new story. Reluctantly, I have to admit, despite its shortcomings, Carbon on the City actually ended up being the most enjoyable Need for Speed game yet on the PSP. Although Underground Rivals certainly had better handling, physics and customization, I appreciate the added story and open world here. And I certainly appreciate not having to complete every darn race three times over. So yeah, I will put Carbon on the City ever so slightly above Underground Rivals with a 7.5 out of 10. I just don't think it quite reaches the quality standard required for an 8, as Ridge Racer 2 did for example. Regardless, it's a fun enough experience worth checking out for anyone that enjoyed Need for Speed Carbon. I'm beginning to feel that every Need for Speed game from here on out is just gonna be better than me. I know, I know, I know. Look, there's still some more games to go. I'm sure we'll find something. And hey, you know what we're gonna look at next? Burnout Legends. Remember how bad that game was on the DS? Oh yeah, Burnout Legends on the DS. Yeah, that was almost as terrible as I was. Yeah, exactly. It was like the second worst game right after you, so let's check it out. Coming up next is a game I fully braced myself for. To rewind back to my DS Racing Games video, the second worst game I have played throughout that entire project was Burnout Legends. An absolutely bastardized experience of a Burnout game with awful physics. Does this sound like an intuitive handling model to you? Deafening music and a pathetic excuse for a crash mode. While it might have simply been difficult to translate the Burnout franchise to a Nintendo DS, I fully expected a similar disaster on the PSP. So, is Burnout Legends any better on the PSP, or is it yet another fatal accident? Despite my initial skepticism, I'm happy to say my experience was overwhelmingly positive. The upgrade and quality should be immediately noticeable by simply looking at the gameplay. It looks like Burnout. In fact, it pretty much is Burnout 3 at its core. Burnout Legends on the PSP, much like Midnight Club LA Remix, brings together a bunch of mechanics and content from previous titles and bundles them together as one complete experience. As such, we have tracks from the first three Burnout games with the general game mechanics from the third game. This means you can now do takedowns on Burnout 2's famous city tracks. With that, a lot of event types and cars from Burnout 3 have been carried over as well. In the World Tour, the main campaign of the game, you'll be progressing through five increasingly faster vehicle classes. Starting from the bottom, you'll be participating in lots of races, as well as road rages and burning routes. Boost and crash your way through the events to obtain gold medals, which give you access to new cars and events. New cars can also be obtained through face-offs, which are essentially regular races against a single opponent whose car you'll win upon completion. Aside from these event types from Burnout 3, Pursuits make a surprising comeback from Burnout 2, where you will have to stop a racer in a cop car. These work quite a bit differently to the rest of the events, as you can't simply do a takedown on your opponent, but have to gradually drain his health bar by damaging them until he will eventually crash out. It sounds a bit redundant and less fun than, say, Road Rages, but I actually enjoyed these quite a bit, especially since aftertouch takedowns are an instant kill and can make for an insanely quick finish if you get lucky. As you progress, you'll gradually unlock more and more cars, most of which are simply recycled from Burnout 3 with a few cool additions from Burnout 1 and 2. As a small unique addition, you can unlock collector's cars, which are rebranded versions of existing cars with new liveries and colors. Nothing too exciting, but a decent addition nonetheless. 
All of this gets surfed up with great physics and handling as it is mainly copied over from Burnout 3 and still is incredibly enjoyable. Even the damage model has been fully ported over, which is an incredible feat given the system and is easily the best damage model we'll be seeing throughout the entire video. With great physics and a damage model like this, of course the crash mode couldn't be missing either. The crash mode in Burnout Legends, despite using the same layouts as Burnout 3, did get a few adjustments. Most notably the removal of multipliers, which is a very welcome change. In Burnout 3 I felt that they could make or break these crash events where if you didn't collect the 4x multiplier, a gold medal was already out of reach. Here it's more about causing the most amount of havoc, trying to figure out the best way to position your car between as many cars as possible before pulling the crash breaker for a massive explosion. The only downside is the reduced number of traffic during these events, likely due to hardware limitations in order not to melt your PSP. But I still enjoyed this crash mod more than Burnout 3's thanks to the lack of multipliers. So yeah, this is a full-fledged, fully functional Burnout game for the PlayStation Portable, with hardly any compromises to name. On top of all the content and great mechanics, the game also looks fantastic with the same amount of detail in the environments as on their home console parts. Only the car models can look a bit low poly at times, but that's easily forgiven due to the great damage model. Visually speaking, the only aspect I find strange is the overdone reflections of the cars, making each car look a lot more shiny than they should be. But other than that, this is an almost perfect burnout experience on the go. Almost. Yes, there are some caveats that I have to bring up that unfortunately prevent this game from being another 10. At the forefront of those is the fairly frequent amount of bugs I encounter throughout the game. Most prominently of those are cars basically glitching underneath the map occasionally when taken out. This happens a lot more frequently than I'd like to admit, and the amount of clips I have to show of this is only a glimpse of the total amount. During crash events the physics can sometimes bug out a bit, mostly due to traffic cars not stopping properly and pushing each other endlessly in a jittery looking motion. This has the side effect that I can see outside the map very often, Pretty much on every single crash event I can clearly see things I wasn't supposed to, such as parts of the map not being rendered. Unfortunately it's hard to play this game for 30 minutes without seeing any sort of glitch. And while none of them are game breaking per se, it's still very jarring and proves some lack of polish. Personally I'm also not sure what to think of the lack of original content. While good fun, Burnout Legends is pretty much obsolete for anyone who has played Burnout 2 and 3 before. The races are the same, the cars are the same, the crash junctions are the exact same, there's pretty much nothing here I'd call entirely original. While sure, it's cool to drive Burnout 2 cars on Burnout 3 tracks and so on, I don't think it's really appealing to people who are already familiar with these games. It may sound somewhat hypocritical at first considering I rated Midnight Club LA Remix so highly, considering that one was also simply a recollection of existing content. But that game at least had original race layouts as well as the entirety of the new Tokyo career. For Burnout Legends I would have appreciated at least a handful of unique cars or crash junctions. Or at least make the races have different amounts of laps instead of always being set to 3 laps. But as it stands the lack of originality and abundance of glitches is something I'll have to knock down the game for ever so slightly. Overall it still stands as the second best PSP game so far in my opinion, and presents the biggest comeback considering its dreadful DS counterpart. A great game for those who'd like to replay this era of burnout, and an easy 9 out of 10 for me. That really was a pleasant surprise. I'll show you a pleasant surprise if you don't start showing me some bad games very soon! Hey, hey, hey. no need to get violent alright? Look, I'll make you a deal. Let's just skip over Pro Street Undercover because those games are probably gonna be decent. They had good DS titles as well, so let's just skip straight to the next one, all right? All right, but you better make it quick. It's time to take a look at the final Need for Speed game which was released for the handheld. Need for Speed Shift was EA's attempt to introduce a Simcade-like entry into the franchise. And while certainly nowhere near as authentic as a Gran Turismo or Forza, it was a quite drastic departure for the series, even more so than Pro Street. Most of the ports we have looked at so far were arcade racing games. And funnily enough, despite Shift being supposed to be Simcade, that doesn't change with its handheld port. 
That's right. Shift on the PSP is as far away from Simcade as you can imagine. In fact, it's one of the strangest Need for Speed games I have ever witnessed. But let's start from the beginning. Need for Speed Shift on the PSP throws you right into a completely unique campaign that has pretty much nothing to do with its original counterpart. Different tracks, different event types, and much different progression. You begin your career as a race car driver in a qualifier event, which upon winning will open up more doors for you. It's here where we can immediately notice something strange. There are a bunch of assets, namely the team logos, from Pro Street plastered all over the track. That's because Shift on the PSP is actually some kind of alternate universe of Pro Street, where the same teams and even the same characters are present in completely different locations under different circumstances. As I was saying, it's weird. Outside of the very jarring similarities to Pro Street, the actual handling of the cars bears a striking resemblance to another game. Another franchise, in fact. And by looking at the footage, it should be immediately noticeable which one I'm talking about. It's not a coincidence that I played this game right after Burnout Legends. Because yes, what we have here is essentially a straight up break to drift handling model that's very comparable to a Burnout game. Which is hardly surprising once you actually look into who made this port and what other games they've developed. Shift's PSP port was developed by a studio named EA Brightlight, which, lo and behold, also worked on Burnout Dominator. It's certainly not a stretch to assume they simply reused the game engine, physics, and a bunch of assets from as many games as they could get their hands on and in the process made something that can only be described as one of the most odd meshes of games I've seen in a while. The question remains however, is it any good? Well, not really, if I'm being perfectly honest. The handling of the cars is very strange, and the way they respond to collisions is even more puzzling. Upon tapping the handbrake to initiate a drift, the car immediately gets a ton of extra grip, and upon counter steering loses it all right away. There aren't really any smooth transitions between drifting and not drifting, which makes each car feel very stiff. Steering without drifting is a pain because the cars simply do not have enough grip to make it through the many chicanes present on the tracks. More often than not, you will hit a barrier, which causes this weird counter steer where the car forcefully steers far too much away from the wall, causing me to hit the barrier on the other side. In general, it's easy to lose control of the car for completely random reasons, the worst offender easily being the instant wheel spin you get upon using the nitrous. Weirdly enough, there's no consistency as to when cars will spin out when using nitrous and when they don't. Needless to say, it shouldn't happen at all. On top of that, each car is awfully glued to the ground. You'd expect a lot of jumps driving through San Francisco at 200 km power, but nope. So yeah, I don't like the handling or the physics in this game, but can the rest of the game at least offer something enjoyable? Well for one, I don't think the tracks are particularly fun to drive on. They're all city tracks. The plethora of real world tracks the original Shift had are entirely absent. Despite different locations, they all feel very much the same, and the track layouts are simply awful with extremely tight chicanes that, as described earlier, are hard to get through with the car's limited grip. The only solace is that there are a handful of event types that keep things a little bit fresh, but variety doesn't mean much when I enjoy neither the handling nor the tracks. The progression system isn't very engaging either. It's essentially just this line of race days which you'll have to complete one by one, occasionally unlocking boss battles where you have to take on one of the many kings, half of them from Pro Street. Beating them nets you their car which you can use for other events. While we're on the topic of cars, Shift on the PSP must have found the most boring way to integrate cars into a racing game. For one, there is no currency. There's no money or any rewards, really to be awarded for events, and there is nothing to purchase at all. Cars are handed to you at random based on your progress in the career, and you can use any of them to your liking. Once again, very much like Burnout, but there's one deciding difference here which makes this system fall apart. Each car has a separate list of upgrades which will get equipped to the car once you beat a certain amount of races with it. 
beat 10 races with your Lancer Evo, it gets a tire upgrade. Beat another 10, here's an engine upgrade, and so on. This is also the only way to get any sort of body modification on the car. You are essentially being incentivized to use one single car in the long run, or in other words, the game discourages you from trying out all the cars it gives you for free, even if they happen to be faster than your current one. As you can already tell, there's a lot wrong with Shift on the PSP. But are there any upsides? Truth be told, yes. For one, I think the damage model is very impressive. I was initially pretty shocked to see these licensed cars get damaged like that, as it's something you don't really see that often. The original Shift had a great damage model as well, so I'm happy to see they maintained it on this PSP port. The integrated livery editor, although pretty basic at first, actually lets you import your own images and add them to your car. Since I was using an emulator, I couldn't use this feature, but it's still cool nonetheless. And finally, the game looks pretty decent. For the most part, at least. This cheap-looking ghosting effect behind the car to imitate speed looks terrible. But that's about all I can say in favor of Shift on the PSP. It is a very confused game, and outside of seeing what the kings from Pro Street look like, didn't keep me engaged. I'm feeling a warm 4 out of 10 on this one. There! That is the worst Need for Speed game on PSP! Yeah, fair enough, it certainly wasn't the best one, but uh, I don't know, I just can't say I hate it, man. Uh, let's just see the next game. Moving on to yet another game I was very surprised to see on the PSP. This time it's Disney's action racing game Split Second, which was released in 2010 for PC, home consoles and PSP to my surprise. There were also mobile phone and Java iterations, but thankfully I don't have to talk about those today. Despite somewhat of a commercial failure, I always enjoyed Split Second for its bombastic tracks and your interaction with them. By all means it was a fireworks display of particle effects and graphical spectacle, if the fireworks were explosions. And thus it almost seems like a bad concept to port a game with so many good looking effects to a PSP, as you will inevitably lose a lot of fidelity. And in some way, that's not entirely wrong when looking at the PSP version. However, there are still lots of positives that make this version worth playing. First and foremost, we once again have a very faithful recreation of the general gameplay. The tracks themselves are seemingly identical to their original counterparts and look fantastic. They might honestly be the best looking tracks we've seen yet. And that's saying something considering Burnout Legends and Ridge Racer 2 both had great ones as well. Not only that, but Split Second's core mechanic has been ported over seamlessly on top of that. Through drifting, drafting and various other actions, you'll fill up your power play meter, which you can use to trigger power plays all over the track. Most of these boil down to triggering explosions around the track in order to wreck your opponents. But there are also special ones, requiring a full power play meter, which cause huge havoc all over the track and alter the entire layout of them. All of this works exactly as expected, and is still great fun. Blowing up entire bridges, sinking freighters, even striking down airplanes. While it certainly doesn't look as spectacular as in the original game, it's still just as fun to execute power plays on the PSP. In fact, there isn't much that's really missing or is inherently different here either. You still progress through events as usual, unlocking faster cars in the process, while battling it out on increasingly dangerous tracks. Each event type has been fully brought over to the PSP as well. Aside from regular races, you have time trials where pretty much every power play is triggered against you, airstrike and air revenge, which will have a helicopter shoot down missiles at you, which you'll either have to survive for as long as possible or deflect using power plays. Survival in which you'll have to pass trucks loaded with explosive barrels coming your way, and elimination where you'll have to stay ahead of the pack in order not to get blown up. The variety and creativity here with the event types really sells the experience here, and along with seeing new power plays all the time, keeps things interesting for quite a while. In fact, in some areas, I actually prefer the version on the PSP over its main counterpart. For one, I felt like the rubber band was way less aggressive this time around. Anyone who has played Split Second before can probably remember that the game has a very aggressive rubber band mechanic. While it makes sense on paper to keep opponents ahead of you in order to trigger power plays more often, it could lead to some very frustrating races with last second losses. This occurs a lot less frequently on the PSP, 
and I found myself less frustrated as a result. Additionally, there were some changes made to the way cars react and behave to your inputs. It's a little hard to put into words, but the cars on the PSP version feel a bit more like cars. You can feel the weight shifting around a lot more believably, and steering in general felt a little more fluid. Drifting also feels a little better here with you being able to enter and cancel drifts a lot quickly. Cars still have very noticeable characteristics and differences. Although I still felt like the heavier trucks were a little pointless compared to the faster supercars. At least this time around on PSP you can actually push your opponents around, which works particularly well in these trucks. Unfortunately, there were also some negative changes being made to the PSP port. For example, you cannot visually customize any of your cars anymore. Granted, it has always been fairly simplistic in the original game, but not even being able to choose from a handful of pre-selected colors is a little shame. I believe some cars may actually be missing entirely, but I couldn't really find out much info about it online. All in all, Split Second on the PSP is once again a great time, even on Sony's handheld. It still looks fantastic for the system it's running on, and it's just as fun as I remembered it. It's so faithful that there's almost not much to say about it. If you enjoyed Split Second and wanted to experience it on the go, the PSP version couldn't be a better way to do it. And thus, I'll happily give Split Second an 8.5 out of 10. And Split Second was actually really fun. Uh, I mean, it was alright, but uh... Quit playing with my patience, Dustin! Alright, alright. Have I heard of Motostorm? During the 7th console generation, one series acted as the graphical powerhouse of Sony's PlayStation 3. That series was known as Motorstorm, an impressive, albeit short lineup of entries for the PS3. The first Motorstorm, released as a launch title for Sony's new console at the time and turned many heads thanks to its great looking geometry, particle effects and lighting. Each subsequent entry tried to further push the limits of what the PS3 was capable of, while offering a unique twist along with it each time. So what's this series doing on the PSP? Motorstorm Arctic Edge, released between the second and third games in the series, and still is the only title in the franchise to not make an appearance on the PS3. But can it deliver on the same principles the franchise was so beloved for? Can Arctic Edge truly push the PSP's graphical capabilities? From the looks of it, it certainly did. Thus far we've seen many great looking games, but I think Motorstorm Arctic Edge takes the cake for the most impressive looking geometry. It may not have the amount of detail of a split second or the lighting of a midnight club, but it still creates a very convincing looking environment that could easily pass as a PlayStation 2 game. In fact, that's exactly what it did, with Arctic Edge getting a PS2 adaptation later down the line. The snowy environments with their massive cliff sides, waterfalls, ice caves and festivals squeezed in between are a joy to blast through. A neat detail here is how the vehicles actually leave behind three-dimensional tire marks over the track. Graphically speaking, it's definitely up there with some of the best looking PSP games. But can the gameplay impress as well? You can pick from a variety of vehicle options ranging from buggies, motorbikes, trucks and even stuff like snowplows or snowmobiles. Stuff you'd usually not be able to drive in any other racing game, but makes perfect sense for the game's arctic setting. They each have their own characteristics, as you'd expect, with bikes being very quick but fragile and trucks being very destructive but slow around corners. Personally, I found buggies and rally cars to be the most useful, while some other vehicles were completely useless, but I'll touch on that in just a bit. You will also be able to customize a few vehicles throughout the game, however the level of customization is fairly limited. Most of them flat out don't have any options, others received them way too late, and the few I was able to customize hardly looked any different. The races themselves play out pretty much the same way as all the other Motorstorm games. They're chaotic, they're hectic, and they're damn fun. Racing lines don't matter as much as figuring out the best route, staying clear from bigger vehicles is very advised, and not overusing the boost is vital if you don't want your vehicle to blow up. It's a pretty good, albeit fairly unsurprising iterations of Motorstorm's moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. Outside of regular races, you'll have time trials, where you need to pass a certain number of checkpoints in order to succeed, as well as a race for points where you need to stay in first for as long as possible to get the most amount. 
It's really nothing too special, but the checkpoint races in particular serve as a nice way to tone down the chaos every now and then. All of this gets surfed up in a fairly lame list of events you work off. It's probably just the way it's presented, but the event selection menu just didn't really excite me at first. But still, this is a really fun and surprisingly functional iteration of Motorstorm. Well, at least for the most part. My enjoyment with the game was a bit hindered by the occasional jank I would run into. Now, what do I mean with jank? Remember the vehicle classes I mentioned earlier that I classified as pointless? Yeah, quad bikes are exactly those. They expose some of the issues with the physics in this game, which are usually not easy to notice, but the quad bikes highlight them very well. On certain parts of the tracks you'd run into bumps, which is bound to happen as you are literally driving in the middle of nowhere. What's important here is how the vehicles react to those bumps, and quad bikes just so happen to have huge issues with them. It's almost like the suspension is way too stiff as they keep bouncing around, preventing me from properly controlling the car. This bouncing occurs in pretty much every car, and frequently leads to some fairly frustrating moments where a turn is coming up, but you can't actually turn because the car is in mid-air half the time. In general, it's not exactly a rarity to crash out because of something that felt completely out of your control. Some track designs also contribute to that, with certain jumps just leading you straight into a wall. Now pair this with an absolutely insulting amount of rubber band, and you'll start feeling frustrated as early as halfway through the game. I've made it up to rank 8 in the game, and with each rank increasing the difficulty, I can safely say that everything starting from rank 7 is a nightmare. I think the events go up to rank 10, and I don't even want to imagine the difficulty at that level. If you've ever completed this game, my hat's off to you. As it stands for me, however, the somewhat janky physics and unbalanced difficulty made me drop the game somewhat prematurely, as I surely would have finished it otherwise. Nonetheless, I don't want my frustration to ruin my perception of what is otherwise a very enjoyable and great looking game. If you've played all of the other Motorstorm games but slept on this one, give it a try. The unique setting, great soundtrack and variety of vehicles definitely make Arctic Edge worth playing. Another great game, worthy of an 8 out of 10. You know, you promised me some bad games here to help with my bad image, and I'm starting to feel like you're just here to embarrass me! Listen, I, re I reserved one more street racing game for you. Check it out. It's time to hit the streets once again, this time in Juiced Eliminator. Marking the first PSP port of the street racing franchise, this game tried to be a spin-off of sorts of the first game in the series. In short, this means that the general gameplay mechanics have been maintained, but a few elements such as the characters have been changed. If you are unfamiliar with the Juice series and what made it so beloved among fans, part of its legacy was thanks to a memorable cast of characters and a plethora of risk versus reward mechanics such as wagers and pink slip races. That's a good bet. To my surprise, all of these great elements have been maintained in Juiced Eliminator. You'll be checking the in-game calendar frequently for events to participate in or set up your own event, get to know the characters and try to earn their respect, and build a sizable garage through winning pink slips and bets. This alone makes Juiced Eliminator worth playing in my eyes. A very deep and intricate gameplay loop that rewards taking risks is a perfect match for a street racing game of this kind. But what actually are the differences between this game and its predecessor? Most prominently, it's the characters. All of them have been replaced with new ones, although they still work the same way in the gameplay sense. Each character, or rival if you will, has a respect bar you can fill up by performing certain actions. Some characters like to see you winning wagers, others get impressed by winning drag races, others' respect is earned through extensively customized cars, and so on. Earning enough respect with these characters will further open up the game, such as by allowing you to race them for pinks, getting access to special events for extra money, and more. It encourages you to engage with every aspect the game has to offer, and despite a few characters being hard to earn respect for, is still a great system that holds up well even today. The characters and their personalities have been completely redone in Juiced Eliminator, which makes the game feel fresh for those who have already played the previous game. It was definitely nice to see these characters fully animated this time around, as opposed to just seeing a floating head in Juiced 1. <coughs> a good improvement in my eyes that makes the game feel ever so slightly more authentic. 
Another positive change I noted was the more grounded handling. Just once handling tended to be a bit too twitchy and demanding for my taste. So I appreciated Just Eliminator's handling being a little more forgivable. You can still make mistakes and spin out if you're not careful, but especially front wheel drive and all wheel drive cars would have much more generous amounts of grip. The tracks themselves seem to be mostly the same as in Juiced 1, with only the environments looking slightly differently. They still provide a great amount of variety, especially with each track being able to show off different time of day settings and weathers. Rain also affects the handling of your cars, which makes these races a bit more challenging. Other strengths from the original game, such as the great car roster with many low budget cars, extensive customization and awesome event variety all apply to Juiced Eliminator as well. In general, in terms of sheer gameplay, Juice Eliminator is a slam dunk if you are looking for a street racing game with a lot of depth to it. You can sink countless hours into the career mode itself, trying to max out your respect with each character and building a huge garage of uniquely customized vehicles. And if that's not enough for you, the arcade mode provides you with a great amount of preset races which let you try out all kinds of cars and tracks in a quick and easy manner. Juice Eliminator also adds a completely new feature called Career Challenges. In these you are basically thrown into a fresh new career, but with a twist. You have a limited amount of time to complete a very specific task. These can range from collecting a very specific range of cars, maxing out a car with a strict budget, or winning a certain amount of money in bets. It's a bit like a self-imposed challenge run, except they are actually a part of the game. Definitely cool if you'd like a change of pace. So yeah, overall this just seems like a definitive upgrade over the original Juiced. It maintains pretty much everything that made the original game so compelling, while simultaneously expanding it by adding new content and making the experience itself more authentic. There are a few negatives to name however, such as the graphics being a bit subpar even for the PSP. While the tracks pose a decent visual variety, the lighting here is just awfully flat. It's simply not a visually appealing game, although the car models in the garage actually look pretty decent. Another point that bothered me a bit is the upgrading system. It's not really possible to get a car of yours to the desired performance level, even if you have the money for it. In order to unlock full access to more performance upgrades and even body mods, you have to complete two races in your chosen car. And you have to do this every single time for every single car you want to use even if it's a model you have already used before. Even worse, you can't even know how fast a car is actually able to become with maximum performance upgrades applied. So the chance to waste money and time here is pretty high. The final point to note here are the teammates. Yes, there are drivers you can recruit into your team who will race with you in team races. Although each of them have a skill and composure rating, these stats are pretty meaningless as your AI partners are horribly inconsistent. Even worse, in one race, two of my AI drivers kept ramming into one of my rivals, which cost me a lot of respect after the race. In general, the team mechanics here are pretty bad, but thankfully you can skip most of these team races if you don't wish to do them. But none of these negatives really detract all that much from what is otherwise a fantastic racing game for the PSP. I'll admit that I had a lot more fun with Juiced Eliminator than with any of the Need for Speed games on this system, mainly due to its complexity and superior handling model. Definitely check this one out if you're a fan of the Juiced series, and if you haven't played the Juiced game before, this is a great one to start out with. The way I see it, it's an easy 9 out of 10. What a surprise! Oh, another somewhat decent game. What a surprise! I better start seeing a bad game right now, or you're dead! But I did reserve one game for last. After having spent countless hours playing 14 of these games, it was time to finish things up with the penultimate PSP racing game. Marking the first and to this day only Gran Turismo game on a portable system, it was time to check out Gran Turismo. Yeah, that's just what it's called. Gran Turismo. Apparently they initially wanted to call this game Gran Turismo for boys, but that name didn't stick around for obvious reasons. So I don't think I need to properly introduce the Gran Turismo series. It has become one of the most prolific racing game franchises of all time, continually pushing the boundaries of each system it appeared on. At least until Gran Turismo 7 happened. 
At first I was quite surprised to see that the series has received a handheld adaptation. And at the same time, I was very curious to see what the game would be like considering the PSP's limitations. Dropping into the game for the first time led to a bit of a shocker, which I will have to address right away. There is no traditional career mode. No cups, no upgrade shop, no GT Auto, none of it. For most people, myself included, this was a very hard pill to swallow. After all, the best Gran Turismo games are the ones with the most intricate career modes. Gran Turismo 4 in particular, arguably the fan favorite, has a huge assortment of cups and championships, three separate used car dealers which update all the time, and countless cars you can upgrade and customize to your liking. Gran Turismo isn't just beloved because of its graphics or handling, but also the huge amount of content it provides in the form of their campaigns. So seeing that all of this has been stripped down from the PSP version was hard to accept at first. Well, all of it, except for the license tests, for some reason. In fact, Gran Turismo on PSP has the most amount of license tests by far, with the only difference being that you're not actually obtaining any licenses. It's a bit weird, but we'll get back to that in just a bit. So, what do you actually do in Gran Turismo PSP? Is it just like the arcade mode where you pick a car and a track to race on? Well, not quite. There is still some semblance of an economy in this iteration as you still earn money from races, which you can spend on buying new cars to your collection. How you get that money is entirely up to you. You can earn more by doing traditional races or earn some through drifting, but also earn a lot through the license tests, which aside from trophy hunting is likely its only purpose. There isn't really a definitive end goal here, other than collecting all the cars you want to own and unlocking the highest difficulty on each track. Every time you win a race on a specific track, you unlock a higher difficulty for that track. Higher difficulties earn you more money and unlocking the highest difficulty for every track is something to aim for if you're up for it. In between races, there isn't all that much you can do sadly, other than browsing the car dealer. It works a little bit like the used car dealerships used to work, but updates after every second race with a seemingly random assortment of cars. You'll always have access to four brands at a time, with only a small handful of models available per brand. While it may sound like a downside to have such a limitation, it's actually what kept me engaged to keep playing for quite a while. This feeling of just one more race, only to refresh the car dealer to see what's gonna be on offer next, felt a bit like opening a Kinder Surprise Egg each time. It never really felt frustrating to me either, as there are basically no vehicle restrictions like in a classic Gran Turismo career. Although there isn't much incentive to go back to slower cars, as price money is basically calculated by distance driven during a race. Additionally, and this is what upset me a bit more than I thought, you cannot really upgrade or customize your cars once bought. You can fine tune various settings of the car, but there is no upgrade shop where I can improve the performance of my car. Phew, those surely were a lot of negatives there. So, what does Gran Turismo on the PSP actually excel at? To the surprise of no one, I'd imagine, the driving is simply superb. But with one caveat. The game actually lets you decide between two handling modes which drastically change the way cars behave on the track. Standard goes for a more simplistic approach. Cars have a very generous amount of grip and handle very easily. Choosing this handling setting easily transforms the game into an arcade racer, as there are basically no believable forces being applied to the car. It's almost impossible to spin out, weight shifting has little to no effect, and in general there are hardly any differences between drivetrain types. I heavily recommend not using this handling setting as it makes the driving extremely boring and repetitive. Instead, the professional setting provides a much more believable and satisfying handling model, very similar to Gran Turismo 4. Also, it is only with the professional setting that you can actually properly compete in drifting competitions. As already mentioned, besides racing, you can go drifting on any of the numerous tracks in the game. If you make sure to turn off every assist and use medium normal tires, the drifting here is actually very satisfying. It's challenging at first, but the longer you stick with it, the better you get. There's a very satisfying learning curve to the drifting in this game, and mastering corners with beautiful long drifts has to be some of the most fun I had in the game. Besides racing and drifting, Offroad also makes a return here. 
For these, however, I actually recommend using the standard handling setting, as otherwise the cars become a little too hard to control. Otherwise, the off-road racing here is fine. It still feels mostly the same as in Gran Turismo 4, which is a shame as I was never a huge fan of these physics. But in general, if you pick the right settings, the act of driving in Gran Turismo PSP is a blast. Especially since the game features a cockpit view for each and every car. You'll undoubtedly notice the blacked out interior, which is more than understandable given the hardware and absurd amount of cars in this game. Seriously, how did they manage to put around 600 cars onto this disc? As a neat compensation though, each car has fully working side mirrors. It doesn't sound like a lot, but consider how many modern console racing games still don't have working mirrors. In general, despite the lack of an actual interior, this camera view actually became my favorite way to drive in the game. That's largely thanks to the amazing sense of speed you get to experience using it, which is unfortunately pretty bad in the regular chase camera. And surprisingly, that's pretty much all you need to know about Gran Turismo on the PSP. Fantastic graphics, great track and car variety and amazing physics, but fairly thin on playable content. Now depending on your preferences, this may or may not bother you. Personally, I found completing license tests, unlocking difficulties and continually growing my car collection satisfying enough to entertain me for several hours. Yet I can't deny that the game loses its steam a lot sooner than the other games in the franchise. But if you are just looking for the best driving experience on the PSP, Gran Turismo delivers in that aspect. For me personally, the game deserves a pretty warm 8 out of 10. It actually shares a similar sentiment with Ridge Racer 2, where the core experience is so good, but there just isn't much to do. Regardless, I think it deserves a chance from every Gran Turismo fan and is certainly nice to have in every PSP library. Are you kidding me? Gran Turismo? That's what he kept for last? You better start showing me some more games or you can kiss your YouTube channel goodbye! Okay, 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 okay. Uh, here's some more games, let's play some more. Burnout Dominator. It's just more Burnout, but without the crash mode. But that's made up with a lot of original content and possibly the best graphics on the system. Seriously, is this the PS2 version or the PSP version? Dirt 2. The ending is a bit too stiff for a rally game, but still satisfying. The graphics look pretty sad, and in general the atmosphere has gotten quite lost. At least you still have a fully modeled trailer being used to navigate menus. That was always cool. Driver 76. F1 2009. Don't let the plethora of driving settings fool you. This game is as far away from a sim as I am far away from getting some bitches. Seriously, this game is quite awful. They just copied the physics from Dirt 2 and made the graphics even worse. The Fast and the Furious. It's just a port from the PS2 version, handling is still awful, but the customization atmosphere can still provide some enjoyment. Honestly, just play Street Supremacy instead. Flat out head on. This is a weird mashup between Flat Out 2 and Ultimate Carnage. Easily has the best physics across every single PSP racing game, but wouldn't really recommend it as Flat Out 2 is practically the same and can run on everything, even on your toaster. Ford Bolt Move Street Racing. What a name. You know what? It's actually not that bad. Decent graphics and handling, but very boring tracks. Why would you make a game about illegal street racing without any traffic? Grip Shift. This is Trackmania with Mario Kart items and platforming. Whatever the devs were smoking, it's actually pretty alright, but definitely no substitute for the lack of Trackmania games on the system. Initial D Street Stage. If you like the anime, you'll probably get some enjoyment out of this. Otherwise, it's just a fairly bland toge racing game with pretty bad graphics. I'm already looking forward to the hate comments for that opinion. Juice 2. Holy crap, it's actually Juice 2. Looks absolutely fantastic and plays very well. Crazy how both juiced games ended up being so much better than all of the Need for Speed. Oh, fuck! Crazy how both juiced games ended up being so much better than all of the Need for Speed games. Midnight Club 3. Holy crap, it's actually Midnight Club 3. I actually somewhat prefer the visuals here over the PS2 original. However, the lackluster performance, long loading times, and worse graphics still make me lean towards MCLA Remix being the better overall package. Mod Nation Races. Holy crap, it's Mario Kart. Okay, I'll stop. 
Yeah, this is a fairly typical kart racer with a few minor combat elements and some story thrown in. Pretty alright, but the audio design gave me sensory overload. Pimp my ride. My leg. NASCAR. Look, I know jack shit about NASCAR, and if you're into it, you'll probably get more out of this than I did. Graphics seem pretty sweet, there's a cool career mode, but I just can't get excited over turning left. Need for Speed Pro Street. Congrats, you took one of the most hype games in the series and sterilized it. Not only is it boring, but drifting and drag racing have also vanished entirely. Unironically, the DS version is far superior. Need for Speed Undercover. It's just a shameless copy and paste from Carbon on the City. Handling is slightly better, but there's no open world or interesting career progression. At least there's no atomic bomb filter this time. Toka 3. Actually seems to be a pretty decent simcade with tons of car variety and great damage models. Unfortunately, it's missing the fun story mode, but if you can get over the horrid graphics, there's surely some fun to be had. WRC. The cool tracks are probably the only thing saving the graphics here. Other than that, it's a pretty box standard rally game that's utterly forgettable. More! More! I need to see more games! Look man, that's all I played. I I'm sorry that we couldn't find a game that was actually worse than you. Like, I tried, like, I actually tried, and I tried to be also very critical. Well, you made the selection of games. You specifically decided to check out those games in particular instead of actually digging for something bad. Oh no, 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 you can't put that on me. I'm done. I just played 15 games. You know how long it took to play all these games? and write the script for all that stuff? You know how long this entire process took? Well, I don't care. I know there's plenty more games out there. Like, like what about Cars? Or, or the Wayfall games? What, what about this one no. midnight game, huh? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm done here. We're done here. I just spent hours getting this stuff together. So if you're gonna sit here and say, oh, Dustin, what about this game? Oh, why didn't you talk about this game, Dustin? Oh, I forgot about this game. Then I suggest you either play that stuff yourself or make your own damn video. No, you're gonna sit right down next to me again and play some more games until I'm happy. I'm done with you. So, that was the world of PSP racing games. Quite vast, as I expected already. And undoubtedly had more to offer than the DS racing game library. But I suppose that's kind of unsurprising. I think the racing game library of the PSP just showed how much of a good system it was. We had great ports, but also great original games. So if any of the games that I showed off today actually appeal to you, I highly suggest you check them out. And so after all that, I just want to say thank you so much for sticking around and watching, but also special thanks to my patrons back here for supporting me financially. I originally wanted this video to be out way, way sooner, but yeah, laziness and a bunch of real life things intervened, so it took a little longer. Nonetheless, I hope the wait was well worth it, and it's probably gonna be a little while until I make another video like this one. But now I actually want to just work on finishing the Pepega mod, which is set to release in April next year. Yes, that was not an April Fool's joke, as some people thought. And in between, I might just do a bunch of smaller scale videos. And yeah, with all that being said, I hope you enjoyed yourself, and I hope to see you back in the next video. Take care.